interesting out of this. Um, yeah, Emma already said we're going to talk about restoration, um, what it looks like, some of the theory behind it, and then actually what we're doing at the University of Auckland right now. So I put my contact info on the slide if you do want to get in touch with me later. Um, yeah, I'll stick around at the end too. And if you think of anything after all of this, you can also just get in touch with Emma because Emma and I are connected through the aquarium as well. So um, you can click through the next one if you want. Um, so I do want to like introduce myself quickly first. This is where I'm from. You can probably tell I've got that funny accent because I'm from the US. Um, but yeah, that state that's highlighted there, that's Iowa and that's where I'm from. Um, I'm from this like tri-state area. So within 10 minutes, I could be in Nebraska or South Dakota too. And the first thing that most people comment on is how landlocked Iowa is for a marine scientist. And I decided to look up actually like where the most landlocked part of North America is, and it is in South Dakota, like pretty close to where I live. So I'm pretty much like as far away from the ocean as you can get. And I like to bring that up to make a point that like no matter where you're from, you can make your life whatever you want it to be, guys, okay? So um, you can click through the next one. Um, you can actually click the next, there should be four pictures coming up. You can click through all of them if you want. Yeah, so I started out as an organic chemist back in Iowa, decided that wasn't for me. So I moved to Mexico and I became a scuba diving instructor after that, lived there a while. And then after, after that, I, I mean, I loved the ocean, but I realized I kind of missed academics and I wanted to combine this new love of the ocean with science. So I started doing marine science internships. And then finally I decided, you know, I, I liked it so much. I was gonna become full blown researcher with my own questions and experiments. And that's how I ended up here in New Zealand, basically doing my PhD in uh, shellfish restoration and working at Kelly Tarleton's. So that's the really quick version of my life story. But if you have questions about like internships or life experiences, I'm totally happy to talk about that later too. So um, yeah, you can go to the next one. The reason we're actually here today though, is to talk about restoration. Um, and I think it's always good to start off with a simple definition. So this is straight off of Google. Google's gonna tell you restoration is um, the action of returning something to its former state or place or condition. So today we're really concerned with that condition part. And um, depending on context, that could mean a lot of different things. Um, so like if you're in the medical field, you can restore someone's health or eyesight to its former condition. If you're into the DIY scene, um, you could restore an old home and sell it off for more money, right? But we're interested in ecological systems. So we want to focus on something in our environment that suffered degradation or some kind of loss, and we want to bring it back to its former self. So it sounds easy, but it's not always easy. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I've got kind of like a list of things that, um, why it's not easy. Um, when we want to restore a marine system, the first question we usually ask ourselves is, what am I restoring this system to? Or what's it supposed to look like? And even that question on its own can get really tough to answer pretty fast. Um, first of all, because people have these differences and opinions and values, and not everybody wants to restore a system to the same state. So like right off the bat, I can bring up something pretty contentious here. I live up in Lee, so I'm near Goat Island right now, and I love mangroves, okay? Now, pretty much everywhere else in the world besides New Zealand, mangroves are shrinking. We're getting less and less mangroves. New Zealand is like one of the only places where mangrove distribution is expanding. And right now it's filling in um, the sand flats in this region. And people are having a harder time accessing their boats, or maybe they've bought nice houses up here and their ocean views are getting covered by these sea trees. So they wanna restore that system by taking out the mangroves, okay? But then you get some other people, maybe like me, are saying, well, hold on, mangroves could maybe help us fight climate change, and they're providing nursery habitat to a lot of important fish species. So maybe, you know, to someone like me, this is already a healthy system. So you can see kind of how things start to get hairy there. Um, you can click again. The next issue um, is about this idea of shifting baselines, and it has to do with how humans kind of tend to forget what a system should actually look like as time goes on. So maybe rather than giving a definition, an example might be better here. Like, let's say we're all on the same page for this one, okay? So maybe there's a bay 
no longer has fish in it and we want to bring them back okay so the whole community is on board because nobody has a problem with the fish yeah um so we all want the same thing but what should it look like once we restore it so for you maybe you've never seen fish here before so bringing anything back is better than nothing but then maybe we go and ask your dad and he recalls seeing i don't know five to ten juvenile snapper every time he went snorkeling in that bay so maybe that should be our goal right but then maybe we go and talk to your grandpa and he says he saw 20 juveniles and some adults bigger than his head so like what if we had the opportunity to talk to your great grandpa or your great great grandpa what would things have looked like back then you kind of see the problem there like our baseline of what's good or normal it keeps changing because in a lot of instances we have no idea what things were supposed to look like because it was never documented and so now we're willing to like shortchange ourselves into accepting that you know a few fish here would be restored when really there's a lot more work we could have done okay so that's that one um the next one you can click again it's called hysteresis this one's pretty theoretical um and if you google this it like turns into physics really fast so maybe don't do that um, but if you've heard buzzwords like alternative stable states or tipping points it's kind of related to that um, if you haven't the point i want to make here is that the amount of work it takes to mess up a system is not the same amount of work it takes to return that system to the one that we actually want that's kind of what that graph is trying to show so um like in the upper left in regime one we could say we could think of that as like a, a healthy kelp forest and then maybe at the bottom right regime two is like um, some kind of urchin barren and then across the x-axis there that's some kind of stressor like fishing or something so maybe um, as we keep if we're in regime one as we keep adding more and more fishing pressure once we get to that point b2 it drops down into this other regime and it's really hard to get it back um, and there is an example of this that I can think of in New Zealand. Do you want to click again? There's going to be lots of clicks here. Um, so we have this classic cascade here in New Zealand where you've got the snapper eating the urchins and then the urchins eat the kelp, okay? And that's all like in balance. But then if you have humans coming in and taking out the snapper, you can click again. So now it looks like this. Um, all the urchins are left to overgraze the kelp. And then we end up getting urchin or yeah, kinnabarans. You can click again. So it looks like this now. And this is actually happening in a lot of places in New Zealand. So if we go back to our graph here, um, you can actually click again because now I have pictures of the two regimes. And yeah, there we go. So if you go back to the graph, um, we've overfished snapper to the point maybe where it's dropped up into this uh regime two state but in order to bring it back up to the kelp forest state we have to do a lot more than just stopping the fishing okay because now maybe there's too many urchins and not enough kelp so any little bits of kelp that stop that start popping up now they're going to get eaten way too quickly so now in order to restore the system not only do we have to stop the original problem like the fishing but we might have to start taking other actions too like removing the kinna or transplanting kelp into that system so really the idea is that a lot of work is needed to our system once we've already lost it okay um that's it for that one you can click again um and then i guess the last thing not least <laughs> we set out to do good but it doesn't always happen that way um and we don't always get the results we want in the end there's a lot of rejection actually in restoration <laughs> and one of like the most tragic things is that we often end up documenting the decline of marine ecosystems and that can get kind of overwhelming um you can click again i just went and you know did a quick search of the literature on um biodiversity and this is what comes up for me um you know human population is growing there's all this talk of climate change it's putting stress on marine ecosystems species are disappearing and sometimes <laughs> it just kind of seems like we're fighting this losing battle um but it's really important to put those you know negative thoughts and feelings and fears even aside um, in hopes of potentially maybe making a real difference somewhere um, go ahead and click again maybe one more time there should be a picture yeah cool um yeah it's restoration 
not an, an idea. It's, it's like tangible action that each of us can take to flip all those negative trends into something positive. And, you know, that sense of empowerment that we can give back to people and communities and you know, helping people to feel like their actions are doing something really good. That's what restoration is about. Cool. Um, go ahead and click again. I think that's kind of like my theory on general restoration stuff. Um, but I'm going to shift gears now. We're going to talk about the restoration space that I'm familiar with. And that's the stuff I'm doing um, with my PhD um, for muscle restoration. So I have put my lab's website down here. If you guys do want to go check that out later, um, we just made it. I'm pretty proud of it. <laughs> um, but it gives you a good idea of just like how multifaceted the restoration space is. Like there's nine of us right now working on muscle restoration, but we're all doing something really different. And our group is actually still growing. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting time to be in this space. But yeah, go check it out because it'll give you um, kind of updates on, on what we're doing. Um, cool. You can go to the next slide. Let's see. Yeah, so I guess before I talk about what I do, one more thing. I think we kind of need to set the scene and mention why we need to re be restoring things in the first place here. And I know Emma kind of already talked about this while we were downloading, so um, I'll make it quick. But basically, in, in the early 1900s, we had extensive, densely packed muscle beds covering the seafloor of this gulf. But within 60 years, um, the shell fishery came in and basically dredged most of it up and pretty much the entire population collapsed. We don't actually have estimates for the numbers of mussels. There are, some people have put out ideas, um, but we do, do, the fisheries did track the amount of shellfish being collected once they opened up. So like in the early 1900s, um, when people started realizing how good the mussels were, I mean, they're like a high protein, low fat food source, and they're actually bigger and of general better quality than mussels found in other parts of the world. So like people really want these mussels. And since they're endemic to New Zealand, that means like you can only find them here. Um, they were in really high demand, even internationally. So we started shipping them out and making lots of money. Um, but if you follow that red line there, that's the um, like the fishing that catches kind of for the, the Gulf and like up into the 1960s, they were nearly catching 3000 tons in a year, you know? And then you can see all of a sudden it just drops off and that's because the fishery collapsed and that's because there were just none left for them to take. Um, and then you can see the other lines and basically they moved on to the sounds and then they moved over um, to like the west side of the of the North Island as well. And it's kind of the same story all around. They just fished them all out of New Zealand. Um, so yeah, there's pictures of kind of like what the ships look like. You can click to the next slide. I think there's more pictures there. Uh, yeah, let's see, yeah, um, oh yeah, I found this picture of like the Firth of Thames, so the dark green is like where we knew mussel beds used to be, and then the light green is where they dredged, so like they took everything, guys, like, um, and when I say dredging, I don't, I guess I don't know what you guys are all familiar with, but you can like think of that as a big underwater break, and they basically just took up everything, so that's why there's not a lot of structure to the Gulf seafloor now. It's mostly just sand and mud because of this. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of a sad story of like how people got a little greedy at the expense of the environment. And the fisheries have stopped operating. You know, that was like in the 60s and 70s when it collapsed. But even today, more than 50 years later, um, those beds have never come back. Because remember that idea of like hysteresis? Like, just because we've stopped fishing, it takes a lot more for us to bring them back. Um, and basically now the mussels are like, we would say functionally extinct. Like there are mussels in the Gulf, but they're not providing the same functions that they used to because there's just not enough left. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So I guess then our goal for restoration is to, well, it's to return the system to its former condition, right? That's like the definition. So we want to go from the left, that's what it looks like now, to um, the right, which is a muscle, one of our muscle beds. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. I have this little infographic that one of my colleagues made. Um, this is kind of what our, our restoration process looks like right now. It's not fancy or complex by any means. What we do is we take muscles from the aquaculture industry and then we transport them to a site that we want to restore. And we're literally just shoveling them off the side of the boat sometimes 
you know, five to 10 tons at a time. So massive quantities. Uh, it's a really long day, but with enough people, you can get it done. This kind of intermediate step you see with the, it says transport and biosecurity. Um, we kind of had to add that in, in once um, biosecurity got wind of what we were doing. They were really concerned with the spread of pests from the farm sites to our new locations, which makes sense. So um, yeah, now the mussels actually are treated like on land in a freshwater bath to remove all the pests before we go and deploy them. Um, I could go on a bit of a rant about how I think that's not necessary and it costs us lots of money, but <laughs> I'm going to move on from that. <laughs> but once we've got mussels on the seafloor, like where we want them, um, the next step um, is, is monitoring them, and maybe not the last step, because we kind of want to do this as long as we can. Um, and we do this, you know, to see, one, if the beds survive, and two, how they're changing over time in all of those different habitats that we've put them in. You can go to the next one. Um, so we've dumped, like, I don't know, maybe 150 tons of mussels into the Gulf. And we're still trying to add more every year if we can get the money. Um, most of the beds that we have are surviving in this region around the Maharangi Harbor. Um, if I had control of the screen, I could point out a few places where we have beds, but you'll just have to uh, take my word for it. They're out there. <laughs> we started deploying in this area in like 2016, um, and some of those beds are still around today, and we're still running experiments on them, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, some of them have lived, some of them haven't. And they die off for a lot of different reasons, and we're still trying to figure out why. Um, a big issue in this region, though, is all of the sedimentation. So there's a lot of development right now happening in this area, and all of that sediment is um, from the land is running off into the streams that connect to this estuary, and they go into the harbor. Um, and if that mud builds up too fast, I mean, you can almost think of that. <laughs> they're not drowning in mud. They're like... I don't know, they're, they're suffocating, you know, they're getting buried alive, essentially, which is which is not good. So we've been dealing with that. Um, and then sometimes the beds get washed away in like one off big storm events. So we're trying to figure out ways around that, too. But sometimes like I've gone out there for a dive and the bed's just not there anymore, you know, so it's hard. But um, for the most part, we have proof that it works and it works in a lot of cases, but we still have lots and lots of questions. Um, and so that's where all of us PhD students come in. So you can go to the next slide. Um, I want to highlight what some of, oh, maybe the next one, <laughs> what some of the members of my lab are doing, um, things we're working on, just a few of the things that we do anyways. So yeah, this is Al. He's working on making restoration more cost effective. So he thinks he can do this by using juvenile muscles instead of adults. So that's a picture of his hand there. He's got a whole bunch of little juveniles next to one of my adults. Um, yeah, and so up to this point, uh, we've only been using the adults. So this is pretty different. Um, you want to click again? I think I have a picture of the life cycle on there. Yeah, so um, you can look at like the bottom left. The adults are broadcast spawners. So basically that means at a certain time of the year, they're going to cast their eggs and sperm into the water column. And if they meet up, they fertilize, and then they can form these uh, larvae at the top here. They're floating around for like a month or so until they find a new home. So they choose their new home. They settle usually on some kind of like, I don't know, seagrass or seaweeds. And then actually they settle again, um, maybe on the seafloor, but maybe on rocks or something as little juveniles. Um, and as they grow, then that kind of continues the cycle. But he's interested in like the little ones, the juveniles that are like 30 mils in length or something. So that picture of his hand, yeah, shows his muscles next to mine. Um, so for example, we can say, Al and I both get five tons of muscles to deploy, okay? Now, if he can get his to survive, five tons of muscles it's going to end up being way more than five tons of muscles than my five tons of muscles because his are going to grow into adults and he'll have way more muscles. So in a way, like you're getting better bang for your buck, you know, if you can make it work. Um, yeah. And as of right now, the same kind of biosecurity restrictions don't apply. So it has a lot of potential. Um, yeah. So he's working on that. Um, we can go to the next slide. I think it's on Seb. Yeah, yeah, Sebastian is the newest member of our lab, and he's all about improving um, the juvenile recruitment onto the restored beds and figuring out where all of those little larvae are going. So remember how I said earlier, like the babies end up choosing new homes, and sometimes they settle in other places? That's what he looks at, 
and he tries to predict where those places are, but he does it using like lots of math and physics. So like he sent me this picture the other day of some model he's creating. I don't quite understand it, but I think it looks cool. So I put it on there. <laughs> um, but what he does is like super important because, you know, people like Al and I can be spending all of our time and effort creating new beds. But if all of the little ones are moving off of our beds and we don't have any babies to keep our population going. And if the babies are going somewhere else where they can't survive, well, then there's really no point because the population isn't going to sustain itself, right? So, um, yeah, what he does is he creates these models. Like this one, I think, was looking at, like, temperature and depth and, like, water currents. And he's trying to figure out where all the, all the little larvae are going. And then we want to go see if where he's predicting they are actually has muscles. So that's kind of his plan. Um, yeah, and it's a really important piece of the puzzle. You can go to the next one. Who do I have next? Uh, oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, we have people working down in the sounds as well. Um, so maybe you know this, this region is like known for its green lip mussels and I keep telling you they're all gone. So like that might be a bit confusing. Um, maybe I should just quickly explain that like, if you remember that graph, the same thing happened here that happened in the Hauraki Gulf. All the wild mussels got dredged out so what they're left with is just an aquaculture industry, and they're actually shipping in all of their spat for their long lines, okay? So it's coming from, like, um, seaweeds that are washing up a 90-mile beach, and we don't actually know where those mussel beds are, okay? So that's kind of an, an industry issue. Um, but on the left there, you can ignore all the cycles. I just, I just want to show you a picture of what one of the long lines looks like. Um, it involves this kind of series of plastic floats. Those are, like, the black dots at the top there um, and then there's lines that run in between them and kind of join them up and then there's like anchors on either side stabilizing the whole structure um, but then you can see like down in the water column there's just long really long lines that go up and down and up and down and all the muscles are suspended from those ropes and I mean once you harvest that thing it's maybe 40 tons so it's a lot of muscles um, but yeah what they're doing is different than what we're doing we're actually trying to get sustainable populations living on the seafloor, okay? Um, next slide. So we've actually got some people working alongside the industry. So like this is Emily, um, and she's working in the South Island. She's um, based out of Nelson and works with like Niwa. But in January, I think, she deployed four tons of mussels in five different regions of the sounds. Um, and she monitors those beds. She's gonna be doing that for the next two or three years. Um, to understand how those muscles are responding to that new environment. And then if you click again, I think it's just a picture of Trevin now. Yeah, he also works um, down with Niwa in the sounds. And the rest of us are looking at like subtitle restoration. So we're all scuba diving for our projects. Um, but Trevin does intertidal work. So he's just working on the coastlines. Um, he's interested in restoring muscles along with other species like the seagrasses. Um, so seeing if that can improve restoration. Um, if you go to the next slide, it's supposed to be a video. I don't know if you can play that. Um, but it's an animation of one of, um, yeah, one of Emily's plots that she made. Um, basically, it's just like a whole bunch of pictures that she put together. Um, you can see there's like a whole bunch of sea stars on that plot. Um, those are the 11 arms. I think we actually have one of those in the touch tank at the aquarium right now. Yeah, but um, they're actually a big issue for the restoration down there right now, because as soon as they put down mussels, um, these sea stars are coming in and trying to eat them. So um, that's kind of been an issue that they've had more so than I've had. So each place kind of has its own, you know, issues, which is really interesting. Um, but her plan is to kind of make these models over time each year or every couple months go back and then she can put them together and see how the bed changes over time. So that's kind of a cool monitoring thing. Um, yeah, and then if you go to the next slide, we can finally talk about what I do. <laughs> uh, yeah, cool, that's me. So. Um, my job kind of comes into play after the restoration has technically already happened, okay? So basically everybody else is doing the legwork. Then I come in afterwards and tell them if they do a good job or not, okay? Smart move on my part. <laughs> um, I mentioned earlier, though, 
we already have a few like successful adult muscle beds that have been living in the Gulf for a few years now. So my task is to figure out how these beds are influencing kind of the system around them and then how that can benefit humans. So the benefits that we freely derive from muscles, we call those ecosystem services. And then my job is to measure some of those different services um, so that we can come up with numbers that like convince people to back what we're doing. And then maybe even someday we can give those numbers to government so that they can give us funding to put down even more muscles in the future. So this infographic shows some of the services that muscle beds can provide, but I mean, it's, it's not all of them by any means. There's actually quite a lot more. Um, and Emma actually kind of started talking about their filtration capacity, like that's not on here. Um, yeah, if you want to click again, I think I have a picture. You guys should try this little experiment. Um, so mussels, we know they're really good filter feeders. They're taking in all that dirt and debris and cestin in the water column, and then they deposit what they don't need on the seafloor when they don't want to use it. Um, so yeah, if you do this experiment at home, you can actually visualize how good of filter feeders they really are. All you need are two see-through containers. Like these are glass tanks, but I don't know, you could use whatever you have. Um, put some kind of muddy sediment into both of them, but then add mussels to just one of them. And you can come back an hour later, maybe even a half hour later and see um, just how clear the one with mussels in it becomes because they're filtering so well. This picture here is with oysters, but mussels do the same thing. Um, I think, they're saying now that one greenlit mussel filters about a bathtub full of water every single day. So if we could restore mussels to what they used to be, think of how clean the Gulf is going to get, right? So that's just one service. It's pretty cool. Um, today, I want to touch on two other ones that I'm looking at for my PhD. Um, so you can click again. One of the ones that's on that infographic was about denitrification or like removing nitrogen from the water. and um, yeah, I guess I can talk about that. We have we have an issue here because we all actually need nitrogen, right? Like it helps the plants grow. Um, it's going to help us synthesize all of our proteins. But I guess there could be too much of a good thing. You can click again. Um, humans are adding lots of extra nitrogen to coastal ecosystems right now. It's coming from agriculture, sewage, waste products, um, even like the combustion of fossil fuels. And when we get too much of that, it can lead to toxic algal blooms, um, click again, that look like this. It's pretty nasty. Um, we've seen this before in like the Chesapeake and the Gulf of Mexico. So if we don't want something like that to happen in New Zealand. We want to start removing some of that nitrogen. And mussels can actually help us do that. So if you click again, I can show you how. Um, you don't really need to pay attention to like this whole graph. Um, but basically the point we're trying to make is that mussels or the bivalves in the center, remember they're filtering really well and they're depositing what they don't want on the seafloor. So we're calling those biodeposits there at like point C. And then basically the denitrification process is like everything in the, you know, the red box there. And you don't have to really understand that, but basically those biodeposits that the mussels make um, fuel the microbes that keep changing the bad forms of nitrogen into other forms of nitrogen until eventually at the bottom right here, you get um, dinitrogen gas, and then that, as a gas, gets removed from the entire ecosystem. So it's a really good way for us to actually just get rid of nitrogen, and it's all because of the mussels. So that's pretty cool. Um, and I'm actually doing this in four mussel beds that we have. If you want to click again, oh, it's a map, but I don't have them labeled on there because I was going to point. Well, they're there, guys. There's four mussel beds there. Just trust me. <laughs> you can go to the next slide. Um, I think this shows, like, some lab picture. Yeah, yeah, so this is a day in the field for me, okay? Um, I'm kind of making an underwater lab with all of this equipment. I think in the upper right, Emma, I think that one's a video. You can try and play that one. Um, these are chambers. We call them benthic chambers, and we put them over our muscles. Um, yeah, it's a little laggy, um, but it can kind of give you an idea of what one of our muscle beds looks like. I put like 10 to 12 of those chambers down in each of the beds. Um, and then we cover them up. It's kind of like turning out the lights in that system. So on the left there, the upper left is one of those chambers without the lid on it. So you can see what, it, or the cover on it, so you can see what it looks like. So it's got some muscle clumps in it. It's got like an oxygen logger. And then there's a pump in there that just keeps uh, moving the water around so that all the muscles are happy. Um, yeah, I think the bottom left one is a video too, if you want to try and play that one. Um, 
may or may not work. Yeah. So to measure the nitrogen, though, we've we're taking water samples with these syringes, um, and um, we'll do this over time, like at the beginning and the end of the experiment. So we have like a like a four hour incubation period, and then we take those water samples that we've collected and we hook them up to some fancy machines that give us different concentrations of nitrogen over time. So that's how I get my numbers, basically. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide if you want. Um, that's kind of the nitrogen stuff that I'm working on. And then another um, one of my experiments, I'm looking at um, biodiversity and how my muscle beds are um, affecting other animals around them. So I brought this picture back up just to show you guys again, like the difference, like mussels are creating habitat for other species that don't exist in the mud. Like if you look on the left, there's nothing there. There's nowhere for fish to hide. There's nothing for them to eat. But then on the right, you have all of these little complex spaces. Um, they're creating a lot of organic material for other animals to munch on. So we're hoping that uh, we get more living things on the mussel beds than off the mussel beds. And then those other animals can go on um, to do good things for people too, you know, like supporting our fisheries. Um, so yeah, maybe you'll get more snapper on your dinner plate because of the mussel beds. But nobody's really tried to quantify this before. Um, so we're the first to do that. It's kind of exciting because we don't actually know if it's going to work. Um, but yeah, if you go to the next slide, what I've done is I've put out some cameras at different muscle beds. You can try, yeah, try playing that one. Um, and I just let them run all day. Um, and we want to compare what's inside the muscle bed to what's outside the muscle bed. So yeah, like that's a squid or something. Um, and I've got like hundreds of hours of footage and I can't do it all myself. Um, so I've sent these videos out to volunteers and I had people get back to me from all over the world. So I think I've got people in like 15 different countries right now um, helping me look through all of this footage, which is really cool. You can try playing the one on the right, too. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't even remember what's in these, but these are things that people have sent back to me being like, oh, check out what I found. So, um, yeah. I like a little spotty or something. Cool. And I think the next couple slides are things I found as well. So if you want to go to the next slide and then see see what's on there. Oh, yeah. Lots of, like, perori. Yeah. And then the one on the right. What's that? I think it's, like, a array. Yeah. Um, so I've got these pegs in here, guys, because the visibility at all the sites are a bit different. Well, there was a snapper as well. Um, and so the peg, like, is, it's a way for me to control what we count. Because some sites, like, if I count everything that shows up on the slide, then it's not going to be fair comparing it to another site that has really low visibility. So the peg there in the middle just kind of helps me account for that. Um, I think there's more, more um, videos if you want to click through those. Oh, yeah, I think this one might have kingfish or something. I think that one might be an eagle ray. We'll just see what pops up. It's really fun though, getting these um, getting these back from people because I don't know what's there. I haven't actually looked through them. People are doing it for me, which is great. <laughs> yeah, you can see that one's an eagle ray because it's kind of flapping its wings rather than doing like the rippling. Oh yeah, and then we. <laughs> I've never seen a shark on one of these muscle beds, but now I have proof that they're there, guys. Got like bronzies hanging out. Sometimes I swear I can like feel them, but I've never seen them. But now I know they're there. Yeah. <laughs> but like with this one, um, you can see like one of them's off a bed and one's on a bed. So it's really important that we have that comparison because we can't just say, well, the sharks are just using the muscle beds because like, well, they might have just shown up there on accident. So it's good to have both, I guess. Um, you can play this a video as well. So th this is a different type of transect we're doing. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, basically these transects are so that we can get like up close and personal with some of the smaller stuff and then we can cover um, more space as well. Um, yeah, you can see like there's little snails and gastropods, maybe little hermit crabs on this one. Um, in that core there, it's kind of 
Yeah, well, if you could see that, basically I take those cores out of the muscle beds and then I'm gonna go through and check them for like little microscopic worms. And then I'm comparing that on and off the muscle beds as well. So I'm looking at, you know, in terms of biodiversity, I'm looking at microscopic worms up to sharks, you know, and I'm seeing, comparing how the beds are different from just the mud that exists in other places. So yeah, um, you can go to the next one. I don't know what it is. I think it's maybe, is it my gape sensor stuff? Yeah, yeah, you can click on that one too. Um, I just kind of threw this in last minute to show you guys. We have like other random side projects that we do too. These are our gape sensors and they're like a good way for us to monitor um, how our muscles are doing without actually just having to get in and go diving every month to look at them. So what we've done is we've glued um, little magnets to each of those muscles um, and they're not like super strong magnets. So when they open and close, um, it basically sends a signal up to the boat um, and then we can read those signals over time to see if they're filter feeding. Yeah, so the picture on the right actually shows, you can see like the little orange one there. Um, it's already filtering, like it's happy, it opened up just fine. And then that sends a little ping up to the boat um, and then we can tell they're happy. So yeah, we've been working on that recently. Um, I think those have been in the water for like six months now. So we got to get in soon and take them out and see how they're doing. But yeah, I think that's really all I have for you guys on the work that we do. Um, you can go to the next slide. What is this? Um... Have you clicked through the next slide? I'm like, yeah, there we go. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're the first people in the world to do restoration with green lip mussels, but there are a lot of people in other parts of the world trying their hand at restoration with other species. Um, and we're all benefiting from that. The Nature Conservancy is people in Australia working a bit with um, oysters right now. And so we've been connecting with them quite a lot and learning from their successes and failures as well. So that's, it's really important for us to kind of communicate what we're doing with other people um, so that we don't spend years making the same mistakes that other people have and we can all kind of build off of each other's discoveries and that's been that's been pretty cool. So what's on the next slide? I've done so much talking. <laughs> um, I guess if there's anything that you take away from this, I hope it's that, yeah, yeah, restoration, it's a group effort and there's something for all of us to do. Um, yeah, there are a lot of ways for you guys to make a difference. Um, you can, you know, make your voice heard, get in contact with local representatives. Like I've written emails to Eugenie Stage before, but like start small, like educate your friends and family on, um, on being aware of ocean related issues because that's super important and that's something we can all do. Um, volunteer guys, volunteer your time and your efforts. It sounds like you guys already have like a bit of a community built through this ocean youth group, which is super cool. Um, but yeah, get together and see what you can do. Um, join forces with like other groups with similar interests. Like I love EMR and talking about what I do. Um, if you are personally interested in muscle restoration, you can check out this group called Revive Our Gulf. Um, so their, their link is there if you want it. Um, they're a really great community group that helps raise money and awareness for some of the work that we do. And they help us with some of our deployments too. So, you know, maybe you could start shoveling muscles off the side of a boat too. <laughs> um, they've got this like monthly uh, newsletter that they put out too. And that's actually where I got some of my volunteers to watch those underwater videos. Um, so yeah, they can help connect you too. And then if you do wanna stay in the restoration sciences, you do have a bit more education ahead of you. <laughs> it usually starts with some kind of like undergrad degree in a environmental science field. Although if you're like me, you know, you can be an organic chemist and somehow end up here too, who knows? <laughs> um, and then after that, usually like, you'll get more freedom to choose what you wanna study and who you work with. But if you don't know what you wanna do, you can just get involved in an internship. Um, you can shadow somebody at like DOC or MPI. You could email some scientists at NIWA or even get, it, get in touch with somebody at the university like me. You know, a lot of us enjoy sharing what we do with other people. Um, and I know there's always students looking for people to help them out. So that might not be something you can do until you're an undergrad, but like it's a great way to test the waters and figure out what you like and you don't like all while making a difference. So I think that's it. Um, there might be one more slide, like some kind of generic thank you something. Yeah. 
<laughs> get out there and change the world, guys. Um, restoring something you care about, anything you care about, that's it's a cool space to be in. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Mallory. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, that was a lot of talking. <laughs> I feel like if we were in the classroom, we would all applaud right now, but um, <laughs> a little bit harder. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that was great. I know, actually, I was here like, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> like, <laughs> cool. I got something out of that. Um, did anyone think of some questions while Mallory was speaking, or um, did you have any questions in general? Anyone at all? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, are juvenile mussels more um, susceptible to predation? They are. So if you kind of heard me talking when I'm like, well, if Al can get his to survive, because <laughs> he's actually, you know, I always said restoration sad. <laughs> he, he's got a very sad restoration project because most of the mussels that he puts into the water, they end up getting eaten because they're so small. It's, it's a lot easier to pry open a small shell than a big shell. So, um, and we've started putting out cameras recently as well. It's mostly eagle rays and snapper that are getting to his muscles. Um, and so what he started doing now is putting um, like cages over some of his deployments and that's helped quite a lot as they're growing. Um, the only issue with that though, is that um, if he wants to upscale, you know, and drop five tons of muscles like he can't build a cage that big you know so <laughs> so we're, we're having to think about it but um yeah it's not giving up yeah but you're right it, it's um it's tricky when they're that little the other thing when they're that little um you know how i said some of my adult muscle beds are getting wiped away in like one-off big storm events it's a lot easier for the little ones to get swept away as well so we have to be really careful about when we put them in the water Sometimes we're, we're starting to think about if we can put other things into the water with them so they have something strong and stable to attach to. Um, so, yeah, and that's a really good point, though. We're having some issues with predation for sure. <laughs> that was a really good question, Marin. Um, I don't know if you saw Mallory Tegan's just written a question in the comments, which is also fine, guys, if you don't want to um, say anything or if you're having issues with your sound, you can just type a message in. So Tegan has asked, how many muscles are in each Ooh. bed? Okay, yep, so sweet. I like this little conversation thing. Um, it depends on the bed, and it's all, it's, you know, how I said the restoration itself is not a very uh, fancy process. It kind of depends when people get tired of shoveling off the side of the boat. <laughs> Most of them, I will say, are around three to five tons, and I think the biggest one on its own is about 10 tons. Um, yeah, and some of the muscles... I'm trying to think. Nah, nah, 10 is probably the biggest. Um, yeah, and I, I've only talked about the ones in the Maharangi because that's where I work, but there's some that were um, deployed off of like, um, where were they? Ring it back off of Rangitoto, there's some as well, but those were quite a bit smaller. Yeah. And are we talking, Is it? would that be thousands of, I guess, because you can't count the individual muscles, I guess, but would that be in the thousands or hundreds? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, no, it's definitely in the thousands. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, like, because I'll dive some of the beds, and when I lay out those transects, guys, um, I'll try and go from one length of the bed to the other. So most of them are around you know, 30 meters by 30 meters of pretty densely packed muscles, if that gives you any idea. So, yeah. Um, Did anyone else have a question? Sorry, I thought I cut someone off there. Oh, um, are the muscle beds um, expanding naturally now that they've been put in the water? Or? Yeah, see, and that is also our other big issue. So, um, you know, my friend Seb that I was talking about when he's looking at, like, where all the larvae are going, um, in terms of like expanding the population, that's not happening for us right now. And that along with the predation are like the biggest issues we're having in this space. Um, because the mussels, um, they are, they're old enough where they are producing eggs and sperm and they're probably fertilizing, but we don't know where they're going. And I feel like if they were successfully, you know, settling somewhere new, 
we would have found them by now and we haven't, which makes me think they're going somewhere that's just not right for mussels to be right now. And it's probably because it's just a bunch of mud and there's nothing for them to attach to. So maybe, you know, when Seb goes out and finds where those mussels are going to, we can start putting out structures and helping them um, kind of settle off of the seafloor so they're not drowning in sediment, you know? Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at with that. In terms of like actually moving, this is interesting. Some of the beds that we've put out, um, they, mussels can move, right? Like we think of them as just sitting in one place, but they are capable of some local movement. Um, and so some of the beds, at least in my experience, what I've noticed is they've expanded out. So even though there's not more mussels, they're moving further apart. And we're not quite sure why they're doing this, but so in that way they're expanding. But yeah, in terms of getting more mussels coming back onto the beds, it's not happening for us right now. So that's, um, yeah, that's definitely what we need to look into next. That was another really good question, Marin. Anyone else? Well, kind of related to that question, Mallory, I was just wondering um, if you and your team look at all at sedimentation. Is that, as in, um, you mentioned at the very start of the talk about uh, it's a lot harder to restore the environment. So if you stop harvesting the mussels and you return the mussels, is also a part of that stopping sedimentation at the source on the land? Is that something that you consider? Or? Yeah, it's not something that we've done yet. And I think it's because we're trying to stay out of like <laughs> the social science -y slash legislation space um, because that gets really tricky. But I think like in the long run, it would be super useful. Because I mean, if you think about like what's going on around Warkworth and there's, I think there's like a new highway even getting built up in the, in the region. So yeah, just all of that development or anytime it rains. Um, I, I postpone my dives because I can't see anything because there's so much just sediment coming into the water. Um, and so, yeah, you know, nipping it at the source would be super, a super good idea. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not we have um, the power to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that definitely does involve getting, like getting involved with local legislation. And I think my advisor has sent out a few kind of fewer emails about, you know, what can we do? Can we, so we'll see um, what some people in Australia have done. Um, like the oyster people I was talking about, they've actually um, started like dumping concrete into um, their some of their harbors just in like little spaces and then letting their oysters build off of the concrete um, so that as the sediment comes in, they're not sitting directly on the seafloor. They have kind of something else to build up off of. Um, so we've thought about that, but we're really trying, you know, not to put extra things in the water if we can. So, um, yeah, we have some thoughts around it, but. <laughs> you just got another question in there. Do any of the farmed mussels transfer naturally from the strings to the ocean floor? Yeah, okay, so um, that Seb guy that's all about the larvae and stuff, he is looking into this because you're right, once they become adults, they do um, spawn and so they do get the eggs and sperm into the water column. And there is some proof that um, some of like intertidal mussels that are down in that region are from the farms. Um, and we think though that most of those little mussels um, are dying because they're in the wrong conditions. So he also is planning on tracking where all of those little ones are going off of the farms as well to see if we can kind of utilize the farms to make new restored beds on the seafloor. Yeah, that's a really good question. So they do, and hopefully we can utilize it. Yeah. I could just see two people typing away there, Mallory, so we'll just wait for those <laughs> questions to I come. I love it, guys. The number one predator. I would say the sea stars, honestly. Um, so in my experience, I haven't, I've only had a few of those 11 armed sea stars, um, but the people down in the sounds are having big issues with it. And the people that were deploying beds off of Rangitoto were also having big issues with it. So, I mean, we've thought about that as like another PhD project is somebody can come in and look at, you know, removing predators and how much that might help with restoration. 
Um, but yeah, I'd say the C stars. It's something you can do really cool, guys. Go online and like go to YouTube and Google or what is it? I don't I don't remember what they say, but it's something about a C star eating a mussel. And what somebody has done is they put a camera inside of a mussel and then they like you can watch the C star like eject its stomach into the mussel and like dissolve it from the inside out. It's absolutely insane. You should do it. Look it up. It's cool. <laughs> Uh, what do we got here? How long does it take you to place the muscles? Um, yeah, it takes, so we get the muscles um, from a farm. So we have to take a boat to the farm. Usually that's one day. And then we'll collect them on the boat. And what we try to do is, you remember there's that kind of biosecurity process as well. Um, so we have to take it to another facility, usually north of, of Auckland and put them in a freshwater bath for a few hours and then try to bring them to the restored site all in one day. Um, and we do that because the longer we have the muscles out of the water, it stresses them out, you know? And the more stressed they are, the less likely they are to survive. Um, so yeah, we try to do that whole process in one day if we can. And the actual like shoveling off the side of the boat does not take that long, but it depends on how many people you have and how strong they are, you know? <laughs> um, and then once they're on, the seafloor, um, they actually kind of resituate themselves too, and they can do that pretty fast. I'd say within a week, they're they're sitting where they want to be sitting. Yeah, that's kind of a long answer to that. I don't know quite what we meant by how long does it take. So the whole thing, you know, from beginning to very end, maybe a week or two. But yeah, the actual shoveling off the boat, very fast. Yeah. Um, how do we protect the muscles from sea stars? That's interesting too. See, that would be part of that same project. We have so many questions around the predation that like someone should be out there doing it. One of you guys should be out there doing it, man. Um, yeah, I think in other, there's other sea stars in other parts of the world. You see how we, we're going off of other people's research. They're actually, I mean, they're removing them um, and they're actually killing them, which I don't know is the best. Some people are injecting the sea stars with some kind of like toxic solution and that like dissolves the sea stars and like I don't know if that's the best thing to do in the world but um, that's something that some people do um, some people will start introducing predators to the sea stars as well and again I don't know if that's something that we want to do because then you start messing with the balance of systems and I don't know if you guys have heard any stories of that but a lot of time when you like introduce new species that doesn't go well I know that's happened in New Zealand a few times so um, there's ideas around it, um, but yeah, someone should definitely look into that. That's like a PhD question right there. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from people? Those are great questions. I didn't even think of them, but yeah. then when you asked them, I was like, oh, that is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and also you can see on this, on this thank you slide here, there's a, can you see the octopus? He's like, he like drills holes into the muscles and then he like builds up a little shelter of muscles. Yeah. Super cool. Um, so Mallory, I guess the one question I had, well, actually two questions I'd kind of thought of, um, are more kind of general questions. Um, first being how positive do you and your team feel around muscle restoration as in terms of long-term success of restoring muscles in the Haraki Gulf? Yeah, it's um <laughs> like that thing I said about it being sad. It's hard. It's hard because um and I think um one of the ocean youth kids hit it pretty pretty dead on the nail there with the the issues that we're having with, you know, the babies. Like where are they going? Because we can do all of this work and put muscles where they should be, but because of what we've done to the Gulf, the system is very different now, which means it's going to be really hard for us to make it work. And it honestly, it might not work. Um, and what it might take is, you know, a combination of, of a lot of things. Maybe we need more beds and more places and we need someone to calculate out where all of the larvae are going. And then maybe we need to put concrete on and build it up, you know, and, so it's, it's going to be a lot of trial and error, um, and we're, we're right at the beginning of it now. So I'd say we're still optimistic, but we know we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. 
So that sounds, um, actually from my perspective, it sounds quite exciting for these guys in Ocean Youth because it sounds like, I mean, some of you will be looking at university um, really soon, others in a couple of years, but it sounds like if this is an area that you're interested in, by the time you're ready to go to university, um, this will be um, a hot topic. And you, Mallory, you and your team may have made some um, progress to the point where then these this younger kind of generation can come in and really start nailing the process and, and get somewhere with it. So it kind Definitely. of sounds like it's, it's an exciting time to be in, in that kind of area, which is cool. Yeah. And um, we also, so like I do muscle restoration, but there's um, another group that's just starting up as well. And they're, they're kind of going after that um, kelp forest kind of restoration and like taking out the urchins and um, maybe, you know, improving snapper populations. Because remember that cascade we talked about. So, um, yeah, people are starting to do that as well. And that's even newer than what we're doing. So, yeah, keep your eyes peeled. There's there's always opportunities. And there's little projects all over the place. I heard about one restoring or trying to make um, habitat for seahorses. Um, I, don't, I don't know anything mm, more than mm -hmm. that. I've just heard it floating around. And for me, I'm like, oh, seahorses. Like, I'd love to make a home for a seahorse. I feel like that would just be the yeah. best. <laughs> exactly. Um, but that kind of brings me to my second point. Um, I don't know if you have any uh, really clear advice for these guys, but if they do want to get involved now in terms of volunteering, I know you mentioned about people um, watching your video and volunteering their time to identify the species on the muscle beds. If these guys want to get involved in volunteering like that now, do you have any tips or advice for them? Yeah, um, I can say if people are interested in looking at videos, I've got videos that people can watch. Um, I'd have to like put something together, you know, but um, we can make it happen. Like I always, I love just like sharing what I'm doing with people. So if I can get you guys involved in my stuff in any way, you know, let me know and I'll try and figure something out. Um, I'm always happy for people to come up here. I mean, the issue is getting up here, but I can show you what I do. Um, there's always things that people can help me with in the lab if you just want to see what it looks like. Um, if you actually want to get out on like a boat or something, um, that would be more with Revive Our Gulf, um, as I think they, they're doing more in the deployment space right now. Like me, I'm, I'm just looking at the muscles that are already there, so it's, it's hard to kind of get involved in that way. But um, yeah, I think Revive Our Gulf would be a good place to go. Um, if you're looking, I mean, if you want to actually, on the educational side of things, get into this space, definitely feel free to email me about it, and we can chat about what you can do or what, you know, what path you should take. Um, there's different advisors, depending on what your questions look like, that I could get you in touch with, too. Um, but, yeah. Cool. Um, I will definitely follow up with you on that, Mallory. Um, and yeah. anyone, like like Mallory says, if anyone wants to um, get in touch with her directly, I can certainly help with that. Um, and don't forget, guys, like if you do, you know, if you're, if you're keen on it and you want to volunteer time and, and look at those videos, stuff like that always looks great on, you know, applications and resumes and, you know, all of that kind of experience um, is really great to have. Um, so, yeah, last chance for anyone to have questions or comments. Uh, you can ask away now, otherwise um, I think that really wraps it up, guys. So was there any last-minute questions? No? Well, if anyone wants to say a thank you to Mallory, I know I need to say a huge thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll be in touch soon, guys, with the, your schedule for the rest of the year, but um, if you don't have any questions or if you don't want to hang around and chat, you can um, start signing off now, but you might want to say a thank you to Mallory before you go. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, so, yeah, you can feel free to start kind of signing off, but like I said, you can stay online if you do want to have a, a chat to either myself or Mallory. Um, I actually recorded the presentation. Sorry, Mallory, I didn't warn you because I kind of forgot. Um, <laughs> that's I all good. Record that, so if that's all right, I'll share that with everyone um, and even those that couldn't make it today. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll share that presentation and yeah, everyone can get in touch if they want to, which I think you should. <laughs> mm -hmm. Emma, you should send it to me as well. I will. And I can pass it out to people. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll do that. I'm, I'm not quite sure if Sweet. it just recorded your voice or if it recorded your voice and the slideshow. Oh, I'm over not the sure. screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, well, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll figure it out and I'll send it through to everyone anyway. But yeah, thank you so much, sure. Mallory. So. Yeah. No worries. Happy to happy to do it. Oh. Cool.
I'm sure you'll get um, a couple of questions and comments and contacts in the next couple of days. Cool. So yeah. <laughs> happy to do it. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to stop recording there. Um, and yeah, guys, if you don't have any questions, you can uh, sign off. But yeah, feel free to to ask.